Yes, Hello? yes, it is audible. Yes. Okay. So before we start, I would like to wish you all happy International Women's Day. Every woman's success should be an inspiration to another. We strong, we are strongest when we cheer each other on. I would like to send a very warm and hearty welcome to all the remarkable personality present here. At 15 days national level e workshop on UGC Net JRS English on centenary occasion of birth anniversary of Padma Shri. Anna Sahib Jadav. Before we begin, I would like to thank, especially to our respectful principal of BNN College, Dr. Ashok Fag, Dr. Sudeep Dikam, Head of Department and Chairman, Board of Studies at University of Mumbai, Dr. Shrikant Malunkar, IQAC Coordinator, Professor Bhim Ra Paikrao, and Professor Rajni Basmare, with a big round of applause to make this event more popular. This program is meant to motivate, guide, and inspire the UGC Net aspirants from the nation across. This event also focuses on providing knowledge for the best practice to the candidate willing to apply a position in UGC Net examination. To start this program, sixth day of the workshop, I would like to welcome our honorable, our of chief guest of our evening, our speaker, Dr. Shrikant. Mohan Rao, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Government, First Grade College, Manhali. On the journey of his success career, successful career, he achieved PhD on selective satirical novel of Aburi Menon as an academician. Sir, sir has completed eight years as a lecturer in Government PU College and four years as an Assistant Professor and Head of English Department in GFGC College, Manhali. He is also a member of Indian Association for Canadian Studies, Canada Sahitya Parishad, and Government College Teachers Association, Karnataka. He has also explored his master's work, namely Abhiram Menon, A Brief History of English Literature, Anita Desai, Bongatner, and Kamala Markandaya. A no nowhere men, a comparative study which is ongoing. We are really proud to have you for this glam. So I may request you to share the knowledge of your literary figure on the topic given literary theory post World War II. So I would request you, so over to you. Thank you, Amishek, for uh, giving uh, such a nice introduction. Uh, so I just want to share my screen. Am I both audible and visible? Yes, sir, perfectly. Okay. Thanks so much. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. I uh, thank Dr. Ashok Wag, the principal of. Uh, BNN College, Bhivandi, Mumbai, and uh, I thank Dr. Sudhir Nikam, sir, the head of the department of uh, BNN College, Mumbai, and uh, I thank the coordinator of IQSC of BNN College and uh, the other organizers for uh, inviting me over here and uh, giving me an opportunity to talk. Uh, on the topic that is literary theories of the post world war 2 uh, i congratulate even uh, to dr uh, ashok wag the principal and uh, dr nikam sir and uh, iqsc coordinator for organizing such a uh, noble uh, uh, we can say venture they have uh, ventured out such a, a nice venture that is going to uh, help many Right, students, and along with that, the uh, aspirants of UGC NET and SET examination. I congratulate all the resource persons who have been giving uh, a very resourceful and uh, very insightful uh, talks over here, and I uh, uh, congratulate all the aspirants as well, uh, just because they have been patiently listening to uh, these all the talks. Which are being given from the day one of this online e-workshop. 
and uh, they are uh, uh, i congratulate them for adding a lot of uh, techniques and knowledge to their treasure of knowledge uh before i begin the talk i would like to first uh, tell you that there are two three points i just want to mention so uh, so i'll be at a uh, i'll be at comfort first thing is that literary theory is you know it's a vast area a lot of things uh, uh, aspects are involved in it and uh, along with that it is not that easy to condense all the literary theories in one hour and i may not be able to uh, talk on all the literary theories let me check how many uh, theories i can talk on and uh, the second one is uh, i'll be talking much on inferential or uh, insightful uh, aspect of literary theories rather than indexical more as uh, the other day uh, babu sir uh, had given is that uh, indexical and uh, insightful these two terminologies and i'm using those uh, uh, making use of those uh, terminology over here so i may uh, I, i may be able to uh, talk only on insightful uh, part of uh, all the literary theories not all the literary theories some of the i can consume the time and uh, these literary theories can consume uh, the time which is given to me so before i begin i also would like to tell you is that uh, my talk is divided into two parts one is the tips some suggestions and which are uh, uh, my experience as far as the literary theories are concerned post world war 2 and after that i'll just be talking on few uh, literary theories and I'll wind up my talk first and uh, before that i just would like to share some uh, uh, things that i have observed uh, over there in uh, ugc net and uh, set groups over there on uh, uh, social media okay, platforms sir. like uh, um, on whatsapp on facebook on uh, a different social media platform that i observed that what i have observed is regarding the the results which have been announced recently with the instead of percentage the percent as a new concept has has come and that has put a lot of aspirants into uh, kiosk and uh, they were expressing a lot of uh, uh, worries expressing a lot of worries and some of them even uh, they were very much depressed just because they lost they couldn't get uh, be eligible they could not get themselves to be eligible uh, to be an assistant professor or for jrf and just because of one or two points or two marks so due to that they uh, they couldn't clear uh, this exam and uh, so in a way i just saw that very much right anxiety in those groups and um, maybe the the reason is that i think the ugc has to answer uh, just because it's very much chaotic this time the result which has been announced by ugc so uh, many of them you know they stopped very uh, uh, as if that they have lost hope uh and uh, in this hopeless right in this uh, hopeless um we can say life itself or uh, the time which in which you are uh, existing we need to have hope some other the way as uh, uh, albert camus says in his one of the uh, very interesting book he says that uh, if at all uh, the hope is lost it is the duty of uh, a person or, or a person who is existing it is to invent the hope right only the hope can make you to uh, right make you to get succeeded and achieve your goal and the continuity consistency and your approach towards this examination matters a lot as uh, as compared to the preparation i feel that this approach is uh, greater than the preparation itself we need to be very much hopeful and uh, uh, you might have heard about the story of uh, myth of sisyphus uh, a book a uh, work that has been written by and published by albert camus he says uh, i think you might know the story of uh, sisyphus who has been cursed 
uh, uh, to uh, push the boulder, a big boulder, a rock over there to the top of the hill. But the curse is that whenever he pushes that rock over there at the apex of uh, that particular hill and it just tumbles down. But he continues to do the same thing every time he pushes it up to the hill and every time it falls down. But he uh, keeps doing the same work and he continues to do the same work. Right? And in this scenario, Albert Camus says that we have to imagine Sisyphus to be happy. Uh, we can compare that boulder to UGC net examination, which you are pushing every, now and then. And uh, many a times, of course, uh, we have, uh, the thing is that uh, the very good news is that you are going to succeed as compared to Sisyphus. Uh, definitely you have, everybody has the capacity to succeed and put the boulder of UGC net over the, at the top of the hill. Uh, somehow we have to imagine ourselves in the struggle uh, to be very much, uh, uh, we have to imagine uh, to be very much happy. So these are all the things I think we have to keep in mind. Uh, we have to change the attitude uh, and approach. We have to create a new kind of approach, right? How you take this examination. I think that matters a lot, right? So that's the reason uh, Albert Camus says that when there is no hope, we have to invent it, he says. Now, the first part of this talk, some tips which I would like to give you when typically you are uh, reading or studying literary theories. Before you begin literary theories, read the history of Western philosophy from Plato to Derrida. It's very, very important. Many universities, they have got the syllabus of literary theories. But the problem, what uh, occurs to the student is that they, they don't know, they, they study literary theories independently without having any kind of a background of the Western philosophical thought of schools, different schools of thoughts. So that is why I, I, I feel that this is a one particular statement given by uh, Hegel uh, Hegel is famous for uh, his dialectic uh, uh, process of understanding the reality. Hegel uh, says that we cannot understand anything and everything in isolation. We have to have a backdrop. We have to have a background. So to study literary theories is why I am telling you just because literary theories are all the result of uh, these all the philosophical thoughts, the different schools of philosophy. Uh, that uh, that's the cause and the result is nothing but literary theories. If you do not know history of Western philosophy, you're not able to understand, you will not understand. I feel that that's what my experience is. You may not be able to understand its literary theories in a uh, deeper way. So the first thing what you have to do is that read history of Western philosophy to understand these all the literary theories. Why am I telling you just because once again, I can just give on one example. Take the example of Marxism. If you want to understand Marxism, right? Of course, you can just open a, a literary theory a book and you start uh, what exactly the ideas, uh, ideologies, what uh, Marx has got. That you know. But from where this particular ideology of Marxism begins, right? Where exactly, how can we trace, where exactly can we trace the roots of Marxist point of view of understanding a particular text? I'll tell you one thing. From the day one, if at all you peep into the history of Western philosophy, you see that it begins with Thalesipri, Socratic uh, philosopher. And uh, later comes Heraclitus, a subsequent philosopher, a succeeding philosopher, Heraclitus. Heraclitus gave one particular statement in order to understand reality. And one thing I would like to remind you here is that all schools of, uh, all schools of thoughts in Western philosophy are they themselves made to be busy 
to understand comprehend what exactly the reality is the nature of reality the metaphysics of reality they try to understand uh, uh, from the day one and the same thing is continued till the date right to understand reality is the main purpose of all the western schools of thoughts so heraclitus gives a a, a statement that uh, to understand reality he says that reality is in flux everything is in flux and a famous statement i think you have to uh, i just want to quote over here is it says that we cannot step into the same water twice so he says that everything is changing like it, it can just it, it echoes right buddha it echoes derida right look at that how the roots i am trying to connect right i am connecting the literary theories of the present world to the pre socratic philosophers where the roots of these literary theories are some of the other way they are there you have to trace the roots heraclitus says that everything is in flux and we cannot step into the same water twice and subsequent philosopher one more that is parmenides one more philosopher who gave a statement no reality is not is reality is not in flux reality is immutable it cannot change the the basic structure of reality is immutable it cannot change this is the dichotomy of those those two ideas the two different schools of thoughts right first heraclitus says that everything is flux and later parmenides says no reality is in rea- reality is immutable and these two dichotomous idea ideas later when socrates and plato come and plato receives them and understands and interprets and evaluates and comes to the conclusion that reality he 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 brings a synthesis of these two philosophers like heraclitus and parmenides and says that reality is not uh, uh, reality is of uh, it, it is two fold he says reality is two fold one is a, the reality which is in flux and the other reality which is immutable hope you are getting me what i am trying to tell you and he creates two different worlds on the basis of this statement of heraclitus and parmenides says that there are two different worlds one is a intelligible world and the second one is a sensible world intelligible world and a sensible world intelligible world where the where he propagates the theory of forms he says that forms they remain the same they never change they are immutable forms are immutable they never change they remain the same or they were and they are they will be the same whereas the reality of the reality of the sensible world they keep on change it is in flux so it's synthesizing two different ideas two different schools of thought of heraclitus and parmenides and he's synthesizing and in that one more thing that we is very much important to notice that in the synthesis itself the synthesis of plato what two different schools of thoughts he brings and says that two different right worlds we have got one the the sensible world the intelligible world sensible world is in flux and intelligible world is uh, uh, immutable he privileges he privileges the intelligible world over the sensible world he privileges right intelligible world over the uh, sensible world and this this is where the statement is uh, uh, is rejected by aristotle his disciple he says that no he says no it is because and, and he also says i think you might remember in poetics you might have read uh, plato he says that uh, uh, sensible world is a copy of the intelligible world right but uh, you can see uh, later aristotle rejects the idea of uh, the the synthesis what he has brought and says that no it is not it is not
am i audible yes yes sir you are uh, i think there was a technical glitch it seems mm -hmm. no problem sir. See, I am not able to share the screen. Uh, all right. All right, sir. Uh... Still, I am not able to share my screen. Um, sir, how about now? Please try again. Yeah, yeah. Is it visible, sir? Is it visible? It is now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No problem. So I was talking about uh, two different realities: the twofold reality uh, theory of uh, Plato and uh, Aristotle later rejects this theory, and uh, as as the because Plato has privileged the intelligible world over the sensible world. See, look at that. There's a a particular pattern which is taking place. One first one is a synthesis. The second one, sorry, uh, first one is a thesis, and the next one is the antithesis. The third one, what of Plato, is a synthesis. And in the synthesis, there is of course once again contentions. There are problems. That's the reason one more synthesis is cropping up in the form of Aristotle. If you go down to the modern age. If at all uh, you have a glance over Cartesian um, philosophy, where uh, he divides uh, reality into two parts: one, the reality of the mind, and reality of the world, and he privileges he privileges rationality, the mind, the reality of mind over the reality of the world. He says that it's rationality through which we can know the reality. It's, ra it's through rationality we know the reality. And after subsequent philosophers, the empiricist philosophers, we have got John Locke, David Hume. They attacked Cartesian philosophy that it is true. It is true rationality. We know the reality. They say that it is not true. So once again, the statement of uh, Descartes that reality can only be understood through rationality and. Uh, it's contrary to it what we have got one more statement that is the antithesis of that statement what we have got is of human empiricism where he says that no reality it cannot be understood through rationality it is through empirical evidence it is through the senses we understand the reality and the synthesis of these two this is an antithesis that we see in hegel later he synthesizes both he brings down the two different philosophies, two different philosophies of uh, Descartes and the philosophy of right, Hume. And he says that reality is of two kinds, the rational reality, the empirical reality. And this goes on and on and on. I think, right, uh, Hegel, I think uh, he, uh, you might know, you might have read somewhere that he is famous for his dialectical process where thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. And the same idea is being copied by Marx. Hegel was an idealist. He believed that it is ideas who which create the reality. First ideas came, later the material world. But uh, Marx flipped this, uh, uh, we can say this philosophy and said that it is materiality first and later the ideas. Right. So if it all you just try to trace the root, if you know the history of these all the philosophy, the, the philosophical thoughts, schools of thoughts, then we understand. Right. See, uh, this is what exactly uh, is uh, I'm going to say in this way, the conclusions of Marxism has come down to uh, uh, Karl Marx. So that is why I always uh, suggest uh, 
the those uh, who are the aspirants of physics net that to read history of western philosophy there are three books that i recommend i suggest history of western philosophy written by better and russell and the second one uh, is from socrates to sat by uh, tz levine and the third one story of western philosophy by will durant the next uh, tip that i would like to give before reading history of uh, uh, i'm going to say the literary theories you better you read world history especially focus more on uh, the english german and french history it's just because the all the schools of th uh, uh, different philosophical thoughts they have got their roots over there in england germany and france so as hegel i have already told you in his historicism he says that we cannot understand anything and everything in isolation right it has to be understood in backdrop in background so that's the reason i also suggest you to read the history of the world especially focusing on english german and french now coming to the point focus right whenever you are preparing for uh, uh, this examination keep in mind right as uh, from the day first you have come to know there are two uh, different types of information one is one that is uh, dr babu uh, had mentioned over there in his first uh, lecture uh, that is indexical information and the second one is insightful information now in indexical information it may be the theorist name where exactly he was born which country he belongs to and uh, his terms and which uh, books he has written and from which book these terms have come and in which lectures these terms have come so this all the information i think you have to keep in mind when you are preparing especially literary theories the next one insightful information insightful information is nothing but how uh new criticism and formalism right they differ they have got um, uh, i'm going to say differences right and this can only come when you read both in a thorough way understood so many such kind of uh, information where which are insightful and very inferential kind of information that you have to keep on reading what's the difference between structuralism post structuralism why there is the rejected the structuralist ideas right what is a uh, difference how is it different from the other philosophers ideas so these are all the information i think you have to uh, uh, call out and uh, uh, right keep in your mind so third final tip that i would like to give you is that the best thing that you can solve the previous year question papers at least 15 years question papers right when the from the day when the net examination began from that day onwards till now whatever the question papers are available right that you have to uh collage and uh, right by forget and those questions which are pertinent to or related to literary theories you have to right some other way collect and start uh solving those so these all the tips i think you have to uh, follow when you are uh, uh, preparing these all the theories now let me come back to the business so many at times we have got a confusion what's the difference between literary criticism and literary theory of course in many ways uh, parallelly these two terms are being used there because many literary theory uh, dictionaries they use uh, uh, these two terms in a in a parallel way there is uh, they say that there is no difference both are complementary but i feel that there is a there is a thin layer that divides literary criticism to literary theory so what literary theory is is the study right it's just studies literary theory takes a text and studies and it evaluates analyzes and it, it interprets and main work of literary criticism is to trace trace or refer the meaning in a particular text to try to call out what exactly the text means what exactly the text that you want to uh, you are expecting to the meaning that you are expecting to get from right that's what exactly literary criticism this is a job of literary criticism and literary theory is is nothing but the body it's a body of ideas the angles we can say right body of ideas the body of methods it is which we use for practical reading right practical reading of a particular text and it tries to locate see this is the difference you know this is the difference it tries to locate 
uh, how a text can generate multiple meanings. A literary critic is trying to trace only one meaning in a text. He's trying to right, uh, call out one particular message that he can get it from that particular text. But literary theory, right, in a way it goes ahead and uh, it does a practical reading of that text and uh, it tries to trace how many multiple meanings can be got from that text. So this is the basic difference I feel uh, the, the thin layer which divides literary criticism and literary theory. Moving on, now our concern is literary theories. Before I uh, switch on to formalism or uh, new criticism, it's very much important. I, I, uh, one more thing I would like to advise you that whenever you are studying literary theory, understand the past of that theory, understand the present of that theory and future of that. What are the bone of, con uh, I'm going to say the contentions, later theories they pose to the, the theory which you are reading, right? The past, present and the future of the theory that you have to keep in mind, right? Because unless we uh, cannot understand the past, right, we cannot understand the present. So uh, I'm echoing, of course, Hegel and I'm echoing, right, T.S. Eliot. So before the arrival of a new criticism or a formalism, academic literary criticism prior to uh, new criticism, it was uh, tended to practice traditional literary history and they track, try to track the influence and they try to establish different kinds of very influential or major writers. They created a canon of these major writers and they try to clarify the historical context of uh, those all the text, even they try to trace the allusions within the text, right? And uh, their uh, approach was a uh, more or less a biographical approach. And uh, they used an interpretive method to understand the particular text. And more or less, uh, many literary critics take the example of play, uh, uh, Aristotle only uh, that he said that a text should have uh, uh, didactic value and aesthetic value. The same thing is being continued till the traditional criticism. Right? It says uh, it was very much, uh, it had the orientation of moral uh, morality and aestheticism, right? They tried to, uh, the main intention of a text is to say that it should give a message to the society and it should um, give you pleasure. So these are all the uh, ideas they had when they used to evaluate a particular text. And, and one more thing that we can notice uh, in the traditional criticism is that the consensus within the academy that uh, as to, uh, to the both the literary canon and the aims and the purpose of the literature. So there was a kind of a consensus whenever they are uh, forming a canon, right? That uh, uh, every uh, now and then in every age, they're trying to trace which uh, literary uh, figure has affected the whole age. So they used to right, bring those all the uh, writers together and Pamukkanan, and there was a mutual consensus. But later, maybe uh, around the First World War, the questions being asked, right, uh, to these all the traditional literary critics, there are three questions they ask. One is the is what literature was, and why we read literature, and what we read. So these all the questions they started to pose to the traditional critics for which they did not have any kind of an answer. So that's the reason, right? Out of this particular, this uh, so the same thing, thesis, antithesis, the same thing is happening over here. And uh, out of which what uh, born is nothing but the new criticism or formalism, which began in the year 1916 and 1935. We have got two uh, sects of this new uh, new criticism or formalism, the Russian formalism. The other hand, we have got UK and USA, that is new criticism. Russian formalis, formalism emerged in 1919 when they established Opus as Petersburg Society for Study of Poetic Language. And this uh, society uh, had three lapses uh, in its tenure. One in 1916, 1921, and 1928. And they had their own agendas. In 1916, 21 poetic and prose language was studied, and 28 examination of literary problems were uh, uh, what uh, evaluated, interpreted in 1921 and 1928. Uh, 35 dissolutions were um, brought down. And as I have already told you that we cannot 
have an understanding of any kind of a text unless we love, will not have understanding of historical understanding here at this time at this juncture of time uh, stalin was ruling russia and he suppressed all the russian formalists that's the reason uh, they changed the, uh, the their uh, their uh, headquarter uh, from moscow to prague in czechoslovakia i, th I think these all the questions would be asked is uh, definitely uh, indexical uh, what information that you can make use of now what exactly is formalism formalism is a reaction against a biographical approach and it attacks the historical and social approaches why the reason is that every time text was not even its own identity to understand a text they always propagated that we have to understand text through biography biographical approach through historical approach through through sociological approach then only a text can be understood they never had an idea that a text is text itself is an independent identity which is self sufficient which doesn't need any kind of a context at all so this particular approach right that rejected biographical approach historical approach and sociological the text was exploited in many 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 ways biographical way historical way social social uh, i'm going to say social conditions of that particular period of time when the text was placed so these all the things were happening so exploitation of text took place that's the reason a new criticism a new philosophy of criticism that was born right where the text was given important the structure was given importance and right uh, this new criticism suggests changes in the material of the poem so what exactly they are focusing on they are focusing on the material of the poem like poetic devices artistic instruments right so they don't need any kind of an external truth right that they can understand the text right so this particular uh, thing you know later was rejected by structuralists and post structuralists of course structuralism and formalism some other the way they went hand in hand later some more things got changed that's the reason it went on to some other way so formalist keep in mind is very much important to keep in mind that they were against of biographical approach they were against of historical approach they were against of sociological approach their main focus was only the structure of the text the form of the text the the title itself is indicate the the title of the theory itself indicates it's a formalism it's they are very much concerned only with the form what they they needed was the form the structure of any genre it may be a poem or a, a drama or anything the main concern this is also very much important the main concern they mainly focused right on poems rather than other genres understood and they always focused on poetic devices artistic instruments and they rejected any external right uh, truth that can be achieved beyond those given rules so they said that they gave a state uh, i'm going to say they propagated that the art is a thing in itself art is a thing in itself and it is independent it is it's it's an organic unity the statement right by formalis it's the text itself is an organic unity which, which is complete in itself right they also say that critic must have a close study of the text close reading but i've heard about this particular term right without the name of the title uh, the, the title without the the name of the poet they used to uh, throw uh, those all the pages over there among the students in the class this all formalis especially i richards know everything right they used to throw those all the papers over there in the hand of uh, the students and ask them to um, interpret the structure of those poems right so this is what exactly we can know so they never wanted the text to be understood through a sociological historical and political or environmental conditions right so uh, one more thing that we have to keep in mind is that critic must not be prejudiced they said prejudice means they should not have any kind of a history of the author the biography of the author the sociological conditions in which the author was born no it was not and traditional criticism if at all you look at the author was there in the center here for the first time author got replaced by 
uh, a text, text, the structure, the form of that text. And they worked on images, imageries, meter, rhythm. They, they were very much concerned about the technical aspects of that form. Rather than, once again, let me repeat it, that is historical, or sociological, or any other approach. So, and one more thing, they, what they said is that the proper analysis of our artwork should be separated from all contextual consideration. Therefore, all ideas of art as an agent of social change. Art itself can change the society. It doesn't require any kind of a context or it doesn't depend. The text doesn't depend on any kind of a context, they said. Right. So many things are there to be discussed on. I'm just uh, condensing it just because we have uh, time is a constraint. So the main personalities of uh, Russian formalism are Roman Jakobson, Viktor Slovsky, Boris Eschenbaum, Roman Jakobson's very famous statement right? that we have to keep in mind. Right? The object of study in literary science is not literature. We are not studying about literature. We are studying about the literariness of the text. So this is the word that's been used, a very important term, terminology that we have to keep in mind. Literariness means it is nothing but the structure. It is nothing but what makes a, a text to be literary. And those all technicalities have to be studied. That's what Jakobsen uh, says. Victor Sosti's very famous book, Art as a Technique, where he gives a different kinds of statements regarding this particular movement. He says that art is the way of experiencing the artfulness. Look at that. Experiencing the artfulness is not behind the context. He is not behind the historical approach. He's not behind the sociological approach. He says that what we need is artfulness of that particular text. For them, right? For them, object is not important. It is the text. Understood. This is what exactly we understand by this statement. New criticism, in a way, it is also called as ontological criticism. Ontology is a part of, once again, philosophy. That is a part of the subdivision of uh, uh, philosophy's branch of philosophy. There is one more branch of philosophy that is nothing but metaphysics. And the part of the sub part of that metaphysics is ontological. Ontology. Ontology is nothing but the study of the, the we can say, existence, the nature of existence. How the text exists, does it have its own identity? That itself is ontological criticism, right? So new criticism is parallelly used as ontological criticism, uh, is, is regarded as ontological criticism, new criticism, textual criticism, objective criticism, and even it is called as an experimental criticism because they used to experiment with the text. Understood. And this new criticism was influenced by T.S. Eliot and before. We have to trace back once again the roots of new criticism there, here, uh, Arnold, and after that, T.S. Eliot, right, Jan Kuhn Ransom. There are many, many, uh, uh, we can say, literary theories. And here, T.S. Eliot influenced this movement that is formalism. And many a times we get confused that uh, new criticism uh, was introduced by uh, Jan Kuhn, uh, J.C. Ransom, uh, but it is not so. It is introduced by the first time the, the the term itself the new criticism first time it was used by uh, joel e springan right in his lecture at columbia university he used this particular term and he wrote a booklet called new criticism in 1911 so don't get confused it was first used new criticism the word uh, for the first time introduced by used by jo uh, joel e springan in his booklet new criticism J.C. Ransom's poetry magazine, and some, uh, we have to keep the information about even the magazines and journals uh, which they started. Uh, take the example of J.C. Ransom, the forget you. There are forget you poets. I think you just go through it. You'll understand. It was started in 1922 and expressed the need for new criticism. J.C. Ransom's new criticism, one book that was published in 1947, is very important. It's a Bible of uh, new critical uh, movement and uh, one more book, World's Body, that also we have to keep in mind. This criticism should be right, aristocratic in manner, ritualistic in religion, traditional in art. He published the term new criticism and became famous in different kinds of universities when, when, uh, when he went on visiting and he went on giving lectures. And yet another important critic that we can trace is Cleon Brooks. His very important essay, this is 
the this indexical information you have to keep in mind that is the formalist critic published in the kinyan review in the year 1951 another uh, critic uh, new critic is halme uh, whose uh, speculations what exactly demanded is the formalist criticism a new criticism has to be right uh, created that's what halme said and he was in favor of technical aspects of criticism so these all the uh, new critics we have got f r lewis group scrutinix critics they are called as we have got f r lewis lc nights direct traversy important writers right we have got the writers i um, would say the theorists new uh, new critics of uh, usa and uk right alan tate kp blackmore kenneth the list is an ending right so if we, even you have got some um, maybe they would ask they make you to get confused and they ask you that which critics uh, which critic uh, belong to which country right that also would be asked in your examination so i richards william emson f r lewis lc nights and direct travers uh, are from uk and uh, the list which is being given on the left Alan Tate, K. P. Blackmore, Kenneth Lurk, and Yorke Winters, Glenn Brooks, and Robert Penn Warren, William Pinsett Jr. who belong to USA, the nationalities of USA, and these journals, new critical journals that you have to keep in mind: Scrutiny, the Southern Review, Kenyan Reviews, Siveni Review. So uh, these journals uh, names also you have to keep in mind. Many terms have been introduced by formalists: the intentional fallacy. which is uh, the fallacy uh, which means that the thirst the trust the intention of the writer and that is why this is a fallacy that we should not take a uh, biographical uh, approach that what exactly the writer wants to say don't get fall into the trap of it when set said in his seven types of ambiguity and second one is affective fallacy how in what way the reader should not be carried away by the emotions right and uh, how in what way the text is affecting the vision not get carried away so they want what exactly here um, new critics try to uh, make themselves to be busy with is nothing but the the rules of the game it doesn't it sound like classical framework classical writers if at all you just trace back to pope and they gave importance to technicalities more this also sounding in a similar way understood so they were very much interested in the rules of the game rather than the content what is being given in the uh, uh, in that particular text so few more uh, terminologies are there you have got uh, fabula which is uh, right uh, is being coined by vladimir prop and which is swarovski it means a story suze is 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 one more terminology has been introduced by vladimir prop which means plot and defamiliarization is a very uh, famous terminology that uh, uh, is being introduced by witchlowski this is nothing but estrangement to make familiar things to be unfamiliar right so uh, this been this particular term was used in the text art as device in the year uh, 1925 now this particular information which i am trying to give you is uh, is insightful information that we have to keep in mind what's the difference between russian formalism and new process Many times we get confused that both mean the same. Of course, there is a difference. What exactly makes it to be different? Russian formalism to be different as compared to new criticism. Russian formalism.
Am I audible? Yes. yes sir. Right. Uh -huh. Maybe uh, less time, and once again, these are all the glitches. Right. Okay. So, uh, once again, I welcome you back. There's, there are some technical glitches. Anyways, I was talking about the difference between a Russian formalism and new criticism. The, the, the important point we have to keep in mind is that Russian formalists believe that there's a distinction between form and content. And the, fo the focus was on the form or structure of the text. Right? They, they believed that there is a distinction between form and content, content of that particular text. They also believed that the focus was only on the form or the structure of a text rather than the content. And on the other hand, new critics, right, they believed that there is a necessary connection between form and the content. Right? They are closely related. And they cannot be, they cannot be analyzed separately. Right? Russian formal is focused only on the form. And they said that there's no, there is no uh, connection in between the content and the form. Whereas new critics, they believed that the form and the content, some other the way, they are closely connected and they cannot be studied separately. So this is the uh, fundamental difference between Russian formalism and new criticism. Hope you've got this. Now let me make a move. Now, what exactly was its future? Formalist future. There was one school, the Chicago school, and the critics of Chicago school were also called as new Aristotelians. They opposed new criticism. And uh, it's just because they gave importance to biographical and historical approach in order to understand a text. It's just because, so the, the, the formulation, the propagation of uh, formalism, what we can see is that all other contexts should be rejected. Only the text is important for them. And this was opposed by Chicago School of Critics. Understood, the critics of the Chicago School who are also called as Neo-Aristotelians. They say that biographical approach and historical approach is also important. Understood. So uh, they are many, you know, we have got R.S. Crane, he has written uh, critics and the criticism, one particular book, Ancient and the Modern in 15, 1952 and Elden, uh, Elder Oslund and Norman McLean, Vian Booth, right? So these were the, uh, the, these were the uh, we can say, uh, critics, they opposed new criticism or formalism. The reason why they opposed it is because they negated biographical book, the formalist negated biographical and historical approach. Why they are called as neo Aristotelians? This question would come in your examination. That it's just because why they were they are called as neo Aristotelians just because they followed Aristotle theory of mimesis. They, they followed the didactic value of a text. What message can that particular work give? And affective function of literature. In what way that text affects the uh, a, a reader? So that's that's the reason they are called neo Aristotelians because they followed Aristotle. Understood. So very important book we have to keep in mind as Chicago critics, uh, critics are published. The, the the title of that book is Critics and Criticism, published in their 1952 by R. S. Crane. So we talked the past of formalism, what exactly formalism is, and the future of formalism, who, who was opposed and uh, rejected by critics. Now let's move on to the next uh, literary theory that is structuralism. It's a very important uh, uh, literary theory in, uh, among the literary theories from where a new school of thought emerged. We have got two things we have to uh, uh, parallelly run, right? And they go hand in hand. One is a modernism. The second one is structuralism. Now the question would, ask, would be asked in your examination, what's the difference between modernism and structuralism? 
what is modernism and what is structuralism how both of them are related and they are different structuralism keep in mind is a theoretical approach to understand a text whereas modernism is a cultural right domain to understand a text i hope you're getting my point modernism is a cultural domain and the structuralism is a theoretical domain right this is a difference you have to keep in mind and structuralism originated in france in the uh, uh, from the year 1950s that you see and uh, a very important point that we have to keep in mind as far as structuralism is concerned language and philosophy are the major concerns and uh, in 1950s um, he it, it just challenged any criticism they were of course going together but i told you initially that structuralism chose some other way and the challenge new criticism and rejected sartre's existentialism its notion of radical human freedom existentialism talks about free human will which structuralism rejects it is because structuralists believe that language constitutes reality language constitutes reality it is not the human being who constitutes reality it is the language which constitutes reality understood and uh, structuralism divides world into two uh, two segments one is a visible world or visible superstructure and the next one is invisible or deep structure right structuralism is used in many uh, uh, sectors that is anthropology disciplines like linguistic psychology and literature right and he says that uh, the what structuralism uh, fundamentally believes that right there are structures minor structures and we have to understand them and these all the minor structures have to be placed over there to understand those smaller structures we have to place all the structures in the larger structure and they also believe that right truth is relational arbitrary and reality is right constructed by the mind and language right creates or constitutes reality they believe in so what all the idea uh, ideas what what we understand over here and uh, what are major works and critics right structural critics that will have a glance over here so structuralism focus how human behavior is determined by cultural social and psychological structures now you can see here there is antithesis of formalism formalists say that we want only the text but structuralists say that we want cultural social and psychological structure and you can add one more thing that is language understood cultural social and psychological structures it's very much important that decides it means they are once again they are uh, some other the way propagating what marx is trying to propagate cultural and sociological structures that decide the reality we are controlled by the external reality right human behavior is controlled by cultural social and psychological structures even the language constitutes reality we have got a number of structures we have got rola bath shaks derida explored possibility of applying structuralist principles to literature but keep in mind rola bath and shaks derida they are both structuralists as well as post structuralists initially they were the band they 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 favored the bandwagon of uh, structuralism later they uh, joined the bandwagon of post structuralist uh, literary theory right so uh, they try to apply structuralist principles to literature and shaks derida used structuralism and studied psychology in in the light of structuralism and he blended freud and sachur right interpretation of dreams right Michel Foucault, his very famous work, *The Order of Things*, that examined the history of science to study the structure of epistemology. Now, what exactly epistemology is? A it's a nature of knowledge, how knowledge is coming into existence. And Michel Foucault's main concern was knowledge, right? Knowledge, power. Understood. So this here it tries to study the history of science. Uh, uh examine the history of science to study the structures of epistemology how knowledge is created from where it is getting germinate uh, uh, getting germinated cropping up so this is what is actually studied and louis althusser i think is very much famous for his two terms keep in mind the repressive he is a marxist of course he talked on two uh, important things the repressive state apparatus and next one is the ideological state apparatus right and he combined marxism and structuralism as we have already come to know in the first sentence itself that structuralism right uh, it it propagates that human behavior is decided by the culture social 
and psychological condition of human being. And the same thing is being echoed over there uh, later in the later stages of Marxism. And many Marxists, uh, uh, we can say literary uh, Marxists, uh, uh, they believed in structuralists. Uh, they were also structuralists. Of course, they changed their tone later. That's a quite a different story. So structuralism, in a broader sense, is a way of perceiving the world in, in terms of structures. To know the reality, we need, need to understand the structures and we have to place those structures over there in a larger structure and how that will understand it. So first seen in the May, uh, and uh, so we have got structuralism in anthropology also. Right, the main important um, anthropologist, structural sub anthropologist, that is Claude Levi Strauss, and the literary critic Rolla Bar. The sense of structuralism is the belief that what exactly they believed in that things cannot be understood. They said things cannot be understood in isolation. Right. For example, if I have a pen, right? If at, if at all I have a pen, I have to. I should understand this particular pen, right? I understand this pen in negation of other things. Pen, uh, we understand this pen in the negation of other things. Like for example, pen, it exists, it's just because, right? Uh, pen is not a bottle, pen is not the mouse, the pen is not the mobile, so we're understanding this particular identity in negations and it cannot be understood in isolation we have to negate the other identities then this exists if if at all i exist just because right because i am not like other things which exist around me that is why i exist once again uh, i doubt uh, therefore I, uh, I think therefore i exist i think you uh, I just go through cartesian philosophy of uh, I think, therefore I am. It is not I think, therefore I am. It is I doubt, therefore I think, therefore I exist. And so the complete statement of, uh, uh, or, uh, uh, we can say, uh, Descartes. So the context of larger structures do not exist by themselves, but are formed by our way of perceiving the world. This is one more fundamental uh, belief uh, what structuralists uh, they had. The context of the largest, even largest structures, they do not exist by themselves. It is through our senses, how we perceive them, right? That forms or creates reality, they believe in. And structuralist criticism, consequently, there is a constant movement away from interpretation of the individual literary work towards understanding the larger structures. So we, they, they study the smaller structures and they place them in to the larger structures. And the fundamental belief that all human activities are constructed, not they are not natural, right? They are essentially, right? They, they, they pervade all seminal works of structuralism. So these are all the things that the nothing is natural, right? Everything is a construct, right? You've got Levi, Levi Strauss, Paths, Vladimir Trop, AJ Grimas, right? They practice this. And uh, we have got like Hawks, Terence Hawk. Right, he uh, used structuralism and they, he amalgamated structuralism and semiotics. Right, he studied it. Robert Schulz, right, he studied structuralism in literature, how structuralism works in literature. Colin Maccabee, Frank Commode, and David Lodge, he combined traditional and structuralist approaches in his book, Working with Structuralism. And we have got a number of American structuralists, like we have got Jonathan Culler. C. C. S. Peirce, Charles Morris, Noam Chomsky. These are all the people I think you have to explore. I cannot just uh, talk uh, on each and every one just because time is a constraint. I have to move on. So scientific at the pinch and for scientific categorization, sexualism suggests that interrelationship between units and the rules, the surface phenomenon that is nothing but the units, and the the invisible phenomenon just below. The water, I think, but I've seen that particular image where uh, and the hill, the top of the hill is out, and the uh, inside, the uh, inside there is its, its structure is inside. Might have seen that particular image. So, so in a similar way, structure is the sea. There are two different realities: the units, the small unit, the, out, the outer surface, and the inner surface. And outer surface to understand outer surface, we need to place the inner sorry outer surface in a larger structure of inner surface. And in language, units are words, rules, the rules are the forms of grammar, which order words, 
does they believe in structures believe that underlying structures which organize rules and units into meaningful system are generated by human mind itself so mind is the main uh, major concern for structuralists they, they they believe that mind creates the reality it creates structures understood so structuralist tries to reduce the complexity of human experience to the certain underlying structures which are universal and idea which has its roots and right in the classicists like aristotle would identified simple structures as forming the basis of life so what they believed is that the complexity of human experiences right certain underlying structures they believed that they are universal the fixed meanings structuralists believe that there is a fixed meaning in every structure so this is the this is where the antithesis lies this is where aporia lies where there is contradiction which is not liked by the post structuralists there is a straight away attack this one right sign is equal to signifier and signified right a sign is a cons- uh, it, it it is it is right it is created due to two factors one is the signifier and the signified the sound image and the image which appears in your brain when i say tree the word tree right and the the word tree and the image which appears in your brain they have got necessary connection that's what structuralists believed in but later you see that post structuralists right uh, post structuralism there is the we constructed it and they said that we do not have sig- uh, there is nothing called transcendental signified he, he uses the term transcendental signified there is nothing called transcendental signified there are only signifiers we do not have one fixed fixed meaning of any kind of a word every meaning every meaning appeals to few more meanings there is nothing uh, called meaning right every meaning appeals few more words and those few more words appeal few more it goes on 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 it does not have any kind of infinitely it goes on that's what exactly post structural believe i'm i'm using to both just because to understand structural we should also no what exactly structuralism how in what way they deconstructed structuralism right structuralists believe that right that conceptual system that has three properties they believed that a structural property has got three important aspects one is the wholeness the system should function as a whole transformation the system should not be static and it should have a self regulation it should right it should not be changed the basic structure should not be changed it should be immutable right structures structures have got three points one is a, a three features the wholeness transformation and self regulation these three points i think you have to keep in mind when we are understanding structuralism now a lot of things you know to be talked on we have got uh, structuralism used in uh, 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 anthropological uh, sector and it is used over there in uh, linguistic sector we have got uh, the ferdinand de saussure and uh, saussure uh, his uh, work what we have got is uh, uh, been uh, later published by his uh, uh, we can say the disciples and uh, what uh, saussure believed that truth is relational arbitrary there is no necessary uh, connection between the sound image and the uh, uh, we can say the signified signifier and the signified there is no necessary connection at all but it is the human mi- mind provides the connection this is what is that we believed in and he also believed in later we have got levi strauss he believes in uh, binary oppositions uh, even he talks about uh, um, uh, many many things you know he talks about i i am not going deeper into it a lot of things to be talked on is just because i think uh, time is getting over so binary oppositions later uh, uh, were talked on by uh, uh, levi strauss and uh, so sure uh, he says that he gives the importance to speech as uh, aristotle in in his particular work called feedis he says that presence you know um, presence is always privileged over the absence right so in a way uh, presence that is nothing but speech is right privilege over writing that later became a bone of contention in between structuralists and post structuralists right so uh, he uh, so sure gives premise to speech and guarantees subjectivity and presence 
uh, whereas writing he asserted denotes substance uh, of the speaker as well as the signified. So where presences are given a lot of importance. I mean, speech is given a lot of importance. It's just because um, the speech is unmediated, whereas writing is mediated. There is an intervention. Writing has to have a representation. Am I audible? I don't know why this is happening. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are all audible. How much time do I have? <laughs> it's not possible to complete all the theories, it seems. Uh, a lot many things to be discussed on. Uh, uh, I was just talking about Sashor's primacy that he gave over uh, uh, a speech over uh, writing, and uh, this was this became a bone of contention for the post-structuralists. And Derrida critiqued uh, uh, it as a logocentrism or phonocentrism, where uh, which undue importance is given to speech uh, rather than the writing. So Lang and Parole, I think you have to uh, uh, concentrate on what Lang is nothing but the languages, uh, languages system. Parole is nothing but the individual utterances, individual utterances that is nothing but parole that we use uh, different kinds of, uh, we can say, uh, uh, the words that are already present in the larger system of language and we utter. So that is called uh, parole and uh, Lang is nothing but the language as a system. So a lot many things to be talked on uh, structuralism. I may not have much time to talk on and uh, let me move on to uh, next. Uh, uh, so structuralist anthropology, Levi Strauss, he says culture is a language and he uses the, the word mythine and uh, right. Uh, many things are there. I don't know uh, how far I can just go. Let me just directly go on to the next literary theory and uh, I've been talking, whenever I was talking about structuralism, I also talked uh, in what way structuralism was opposed and uh, got uh, rejected by post-structuralists. Uh, that also I talked on. And let me directly move on to post-structuralism. Very quickly, I'll just make you to have a glance over post-structuralism. Of course, there are many terminologies. We have got sign is equal to signified, relational, right, relationality, arbitrariness, right? N number of uh, such kind of terminologies that I advise you to go through them. And understand structuralism through the uh, to anthropologist point of view, linguist point of view, and uh, structuralist point of view. So these three things, I think, you have to keep in mind when you are right reading uh, structuralism. Now, next is post-structuralism. Post-structuralism, right? It emerged in France in 1960s, and uh, it was uh, the so there was a, a kind of a love and hate relationship between uh, st structuralists and post-structuralists, right? We have got Roland Barth, Shaks Lacan, Julia Kristeva, Michel Foucault, right? Initially, they were all structuralists, but later they shifted and they joined the bandwagon of uh, post-structuralists. 
and uh, the main fundamental belief of post structuralism or the deconstructive way is nothing but that this polysemic nature of semiotic code which are encoded in a text so they same thing that uh, what i'm trying to tell you is that meaning is not fixed meaning is polysemic in nature we cannot have only one meaning fixed meaning and right? that's what post structuralists believed in this is totally a contrary argument right against the structuralists Structuralists believe that is a fixed meaning in every structure, whereas post-structuralists believe that the, the meaning itself is polysemic in nature, and that is the fundamental belief of post-structuralists. Right. So, having originated in politically volatile climate, the theory that right, placed a lot of stress on operations of ideology, power of, of human subjectivity, where structuralists they placed a lot of importance to uh, the language. and they believe that language creates or constitutes reality right we also came to know about logocentrism in what way uh uh so sure they believe that presence is uh, how in in what way present um, uh, what presence is privileged over the absence and here the contrary idea of uh, uh we can say derrida is that some of the other way writing has got its upper hand although it has been represented right so he talks about metaphysics of presence he talks about a deconstruction he talks about difference the word right manipulated word that uh, will quickly have a glance over so plato in a, in his one particular book called phaedrus right he said that right he argued that it is the speech which uh, right uh, that makes you to reach the reality right the speech is unmediated truth that's what exactly he said and later aristotle that he did not agree to it and but later we, when we when it comes to structuralism then structures believed that of course uh, they 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 uh, favored plato they believed that speech is always given at uh, is is always at the upper hand the privileged speech over the writing right so uh, they carried forward or post structural they carried forward martin heidegger's revision of metaphysics of presence now what all these things that you just go through it now i'll quickly uh, make you to have a glance over what exactly is difference because many uh, aspirants they get confused with uh, this particular word in re, uh, in in french difference is spelled as d i w f e r e r and he has manipulated this particular word by taking out e and placed a and this particular difference has got two features one is a d e f e r defer and second one is defer defer is nothing but to postpone or schedule right schedule to a later part of time and defer is nothing but not to be alive not to be the same now i'll make you to understand this one in this way the meaning of any word they believe the main concept of structuralism is that they never believe that there is a fixed meaning they believe that the meaning of no word is is its final meaning a set of words only to be investigated further and further fresh words they come take the example over here sign is equal to signifier and signified cat when i utter the word the sound image of cat right i suddenly the image appears over here is of a cat in the brain right so structures believe that this word and this image they it, it it is of course right uh, some of the other way they are relate, related but they are uh, they are arbitrary in nature whereas derrida take the example of sher itself he doesn't believe that right he says that there there is nothing called signified there is there are only the signifiers take the example of sher if i utter the word wife and i look and peep into the dictionary the meaning of the word wife right it means it, it, it the definition is given over there is women that one married to so the word wife which i looked into the dictionary has got definition it is it is appealing to one more right one more word called women and once again i look into the dictionary to know and understand the word women 
and the dictionary gives one more definition or one more word it appeals to that is an adult female human being right when i look once again this particular word adult in the into the dictionary and the definition once again it differs so in this way it goes on and on and on it does not have any kind of an end every he says that we have got only signifiers to understand there is nothing called meaning because meaning cannot be found he says that we have got only words that describe a meaning but it is not in reality meaning at all when i try to look into the dictionary the meaning of wife it gave me a few more words it appealed more few more words like wife when i when i uh, looked into the dictionary the definition of wife i got right it, it appealed to me one more word that is nothing but women when i try to look into dictionary the meaning of women definition of women once again it appealed to one more word that is adult and this thing goes on continuing it does not have any kind of an end it is infinite so that is why this is the main uh, fundamental belief of deconstruction or post structuralist ideas understood so uh, structuralism and post structuralism there is no the difference is that they believe that there is a transcendental sign signified and whereas the post structures they believe that there is nothing called transcendental signified there are only signifiers because every signifier contain aporia there is contradiction and whenever we try to get that particular word signified we won't we only will get words rather than the meaning itself hope you are trying to uh, understanding this one what derrida says is that and what is deconstruct deconstruction is not the rejection deconstruction is nothing but untwining the possibilities untwining the possible i am using the word untwining the possibilities understood so signifiers have got few more signifiers it does not get signified at all as you can see over here right wife when i try to refer to the word uh, the de definition over there in the dictionary i got wife is a women women once again i try to look into the dictionary to understand that one i got one more word adult right and when i try to look into the dictionary the meaning of adult one more word i got the person when i try to look in to know understand what exactly person is once again i have got something else and this goes on 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 and on infinitely does not have any kind of an end at all i would have talked a lot on this but uh, i don't know uh, the time is a constraint anyways a uh, lot of things to be uh, talked on post structuralism and uh, let me directly move on to the last uh so the last slide of this uh, presentation there are many other critical approaches or literary theories that you have to go through and uh, keep in mind when you are studying literary theory once again let me bring back those all the tips that you read history of western philosophy read history of europe or uh, especially focusing on in, uh, england and uh, french and german and uh, and after that you start studying uh, these all the approaches or literary theories so that you can understand the, the depth of these all the theories in a better way and some other literary theories are also there you have i have missed i, I if at all uh, the time had permitted me i would have talked much on uh, uh, we have got uh, uh, after post structuralism we have got marxism feminism we have got psychological criticism new criticism many are there number is uh, a lot right so that's the reason uh, the problem is the time is a constraint i just would want to wind up over here a lot many things to be talked on but as shakespeare in his sonnet 116 says that we are all the slaves of time so that's the reason initially i just uh, apprehended that i whether i uh, would complete these all the theories or not but i have i i believe that some of the things i have made made it very much clear to you all and uh, uh, i i believe that with the positive note that i have given you some at least the hints you know and the approaches which can be used to understand these literary theories i believe that you have uh, it's been conveyed to you uh to talk on one particular literary theory at least it takes 8 to 10 15 days 
many many terminologies especially structuralism post structuralism it it goes on for one month two months right many many uh, post structuralists uh, we can say uh, uh, theorists are there we have to look into their terminologies and we have to compare and contrast those uh, um, the terminologies with other uh, we can say uh, other approaches or other literary theories in what way uh, uh, they understood the reality so these all the things you know it goes on and to talk on each and every theory it's it it it's a lot, it requires a lot of time but i i believe that with a positive note that i believe that uh that you have at least got some uh thing out of this particular presentation and uh i advise you don't uh right uh do away with whatever i said keep in mind read history of western philosophy his history of europe and next uh indexical information and inferential information insightful information and go through all the question papers which are available right solve question paper of course the guides are available in the market go through them and uh, uh, call out all those questions which have been asked on literary theories separate them right and go through them in what way the we will come to know how in what way on which areas they are focusing more on which literary theory they are they are asking questions right so you'll understand by uh, doing that so uh, with a positive know that many things you have understood and uh, i might have conveyed right so uh, with this i wind up my uh, presentation i thank the principal of uh, bnn college and uh, i also thank dr sudhin ikam sir and uh, the iqc coordinator and all the organizers uh, for giving me this opportunity and i also thank all the aspirants who have been who here patiently listening to me and uh, uh, i uh, with a positive note i end this uh, uh, talk believing that you have got something out of it thank you so much over to you thank you so much sir i that was i definitely we all will keep all things what you have said us to keep us keep us all these things in, in our mind and uh, all the tips and ideas which you have actually shared us and uh, that will be you know this will this will always be in our mind i uh, thank you so much for giving so much of information that was inspirational and also full of acknowledgement this will be really helpful for uh, for all our uh, all these aspirants as we have as you have expressed your views in such a way that every detail was more clear to us all the part which you have explained was so much easy and acquaintance i wish to all the participants to perform well for ugc net examination in future so for so thank you so much so that was actually a fortunate to have such a remarkable remarkable personality thank you for more than a galaxy for contributing your auspicious time and encouragement i also want to thank a million to all the participants present over here it will be an immense pleasure to to, in, to inform you the next session on day 7 which is edutainment personality madam minakshi shrivastava tomorrow this event will be co-host by anam shekh so thank you everyone for your patience thank you thank you very much i once again wish all the aspirants uh, that you would uh, succeed in your future endeavors thank you so much good night thank you sir thank you for your thoughts